Hi, good morning or good afternoon, Giovanni, and all the rest of you. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me for presenting at, at this meeting. I really quite enjoyed all the presentations so far. And, and you know, I don't have to add anything to what Chris said. He was absolutely right. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm going to switch uh, uh, um, paces and we'll, we'll talk about uh, Magnon excitations and hybrid Magnon excitations. Um, so that's, that's my, my, my goal today. So here's briefly what I want to tell you about. I want to tell you how hybrid Magnon modes may be useful for uh, things like coherent information processing. And then I will talk about um, how we can use an on-chip geometry um, to look at magnon photon coupling. And I'll also uh, tell you about magnon magnon coupling in bilayer films and some new features that we can see there. And we'll have a few brief conclusions in the end. Okay, so. Let's start off with why we're interested for in hybrid magnons for coherent information processing. Um, so you can use magnons for coherent information processing um, because they are a wave phenomena. So you have the amplitude and the phase that you can encode information in. And then you want to um, couple these waves to other wave-like phenomena. Um, you can do this both in the quantum regime or, or the classical regime. And um, what makes magnons really interesting for these purposes is, is that you can have very strong coupling to other excitations. For example, if you have a magnon in a ferromagnet and you couple it to a microwave photon, the coupling strength can be a uh, couple hundred megahertz, sub gigahertz. So it can be easily 10% um, you know, or so of the excitation frequency. And the reason for that is, is um, that the overall coupling strength um, goes as the square root of N um, of the number of spins that you have in your system. And so by using a ferromagnetic system instead of a single spin system, you just get much, much stronger coupling. Okay, so um, the other thing that makes magnons really very interesting is that magnons easily couple to all kinds of things. They couple to microwaves. Um, that's how we often excite them. We can see optical excitations. We can even couple them to elastic excitations in, in our media. And of course, we can couple them to, to other spin excitations. So there's a whole bunch of varieties where magnons may act as the intermediary between other um, um, you know, modalities that you may have. For example, microwaves and superconducting qubits are used for current computation, while uh, phonons, uh, photons on light are used for quantum communication. So you could easily think about coupling the two via the magnon excitations. Okay, so um, I already mentioned that magnons are inherently uh, wave-like phenomena, uh, so we also call them spin waves, right? And so you can think of using kind of interference kind of phenomena to create uh, some logic functionality. Um, and the last thing, what makes magnons nice is, you know, their, their frequency are in the microwave regime and microwaves is what typically is used for quantum circuitry, for example, when you use superconducting qubits. Um, so, you can easily think about um, how to integrate them into such microwave circuitry. And that will be a good part of the discussion that we have here. And if you're really interested in a more detailed discussion of these ideas, I recommend this, this uh, review paper here that we published last year, where we does discuss this even in much more detail. Okay, so this is kind of reiterating the points that I made so far. Um, one thing that are nice about magnons is that you can coherently couple them to uh, uh, microwave photons, to phonons, to other magnons, to optical excitations. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of interesting physics um, that you can have. You can have different coupling mechanisms. You can have uh, uh, dissipative coupling, uh, for example, like in spin pumping. 
um, you get non-reciprocal phenomena very easily, uh, which is very interesting um, for especially some of these microwave circuitry. Um, and you can have it in all kinds of different uh, platforms. Um, lots of the initial work was done on 3D cavities, but as I'll show here, you can also use uh, uh, planar geometries, you know, superconducting materials. Um, so there's a wide variety of systems that you can couple to. Okay. So um, all I will discuss will actually be still in the classical regime. We don't go to the limit of individual uh, single magnons, but I want to point out that this is actually possible. Um, and this was really very nicely shown in an experiment um, where they put the superconducting qubit together with a Yig sphere into a microwave cavity. And using the cavity mode, they could couple the uh, ferromagnetic resonance in the Yig sphere to the excitations of the qubit. And so they saw a nice clear anti-crossing indicating the strong coupling between the two. So which allowed then to use the superconducting qubit to uh, detect actually individual magnets. So you can take it down to the quantum level if you are interested in that. But um, what my goal is now is to discuss more, how can we engineer magnon systems um, in a more planar circuit type of device uh, where we have, let's say a superconducting resonator and we integrate a magnetic device inside of it. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna discuss next. Um, so as I mentioned, um, lots of the initial work that looked at magnon photon coupling was done by placing a, yik, uh, a sphere into a, a, a microwave resonator. Um, but these are kind of bulky, and so it's not easy to integrate you know, into a more complex uh, kind of uh, system. So what we did instead then is we um, defined the superconducting resonator, uh, which is defined by having two capacitively coupled ends, so that sets the wavelength of our resonator. And then in the resonator, in the center of the resonator, uh, where the magnetic fields will be maximized, um, we placed in a magnetic element, in our case, a small uh, permaloid strip. And we can then measure the microwave transport properties of the system using a vector analyzer. Um, so for the photon system, we use a superconducting resonator based on niobium nitride. Niobium nitride is really very nice because its TC is relatively high, um, which means that you know, it can accommodate higher frequencies than um, systems based on aluminum, for example, or niobium, um, which also then means we can get away with smaller um, microwave wavelengths and, and thereby smaller devices. Um, and for the magnetic system, we, instead of what was previously used, uh, yttrium iron garnet, we simply use permaloy. The main reason is it's much easier to integrate into the superconducting uh, uh, place, even though the damping is, is definitely worse than uh, um, uh, for yttrium iron garnet. But one advantage that we have is we have a relatively large magnetization. So the coupling it couples then stronger to the microwave field um, than, than Yik would do. So um, here's an actual picture of the actual uh, superconducting circuit. Um, so here's a blow up uh, where we then see the uh, permaloy um, uh, system on top of the signal line of the superconducting resonator. And so if you look in cross section, you see that this uh, permaloy strip sits on top of the um, niobium nitride layer, but it's separated by a magnesium oxide layer um, to uh, give some electrical insulation from the superconducting circuit. Okay, um, but essentially um, we just have the microwave fields around the niobium signal, niobium nitride signal lines that then couple to the permaloy. So the first thing that we look at 
is just the niobium nitride superconducting resonator without the permalloy. And um, so here you see a measurement of the uh, transmission of this um, uh, resonator. So here is the transmission as a function of frequency. And we see a nice and narrow uh, uh, line shape with a quality factor of roughly seven and a half thousand. Um, so this is measured at, at 1.4 Kelvin. Um, now we did look at the magnetic field dependence and we do see that the resonance frequency actually does depend on the um, uh, magnetic field. There's also some, some hysteresis, uh, whether you uh, sweep the field up or the field down. And the main reason for this is, is, is that with the applied field, you introduce additional superconducting vortices in a superconducting film. And um, this gives rise to an additional uh, inductance um, in the system. And since the resonance frequency is inversely proportional to the square root of the inductance, the introduction of these additional vortices then leads to a reduction of the um, resonance frequency of your, our circuit. So the next thing that we then do is measure just what the permalloy stripe, how it behaves on its own. Uh, so um, we drive the system with a very high power, which essentially means that the uh, superconductor becomes normal, even at these low temperatures. And um, when we do this, we see, as we expect uh, the magnon frequency changing as a function of magnetic field, you know, consistent with uh, the Kittel equation, um, we can fit this. Um, we get our, uh, our saturation magnetization and, but more importantly, we also get uh, the damping. So we measured the line width of what we see as a function of frequency. We see that we get a reasonably good linear behavior. And by fitting this, we get a damping of uh, roughly 0.01. You know, so that's not mind blowingly good, but it's good enough for the purposes uh, that we have here. So essentially the magnon relaxation rate is of you know, 170 megahertz roughly for if we excite at five gigahertz, which is you know, close to the resonance frequency of the resonator. Okay, so now once we have all these uh, characterizations out of place, we can look at the coupled hybrid system. So now we have the niobium uh, nitride resonator. Um, this is the frequency dependence of the resonator as a function of field without uh, um, the, the permalloy. Okay, um, now we can add the permalloy to the device. And what we see is um, that where the magnon modes cross you know, the uh, uh, photon modes in the resonators, we see large gaps developing. So there is a strong uh, um, anti-crossing of these two modes. And so um, that indicates that we have really strong coupling between the magnons and photons in these systems. Um, now we can look at what the photon damping rate is by just um, looking far away from where this anti-crossing is. And we see that the photon damping rate is about two megahertz. So the quality factor is only two and a half thousand. So just by integrating the permalloy into the superconducting resonator, we actually decrease its uh, quality factor you know, by a factor of three, um, but, but it's still reasonably high. So now we can um, look at what is the, the, the coupling energy. The coupling energy is really just given by the uh, magnetization of the permalloy coupling to the RF field of the um, uh, superconducting resonator. Okay. So um, we can analyze this further. So this is just a cleaner picture of what we have here on the left. And um, here below, we also see um, the line width of both the photon and the hybrid uh, mode um, that, that we investigated. And the, the mode crossing um, positions are here. So we can 
calculate the uh, uh, power absorption that we have by um, looking at the, um, uh, the uh, relaxation rate of the photons, the relaxation rate of the magnons, um, and the uh, coupling constant between these. And when we um, do this, we can uh, fit the coupling constant and we get then a coupling that is around 0.1 for 150 megahertz. And so we can calculate the cooperativity, which is the coupling strength squared over the individual relaxation rates. And the cooperativity is around 70. So that means that you have essentially roughly 70 exchanges between the photon and the magnon modes before the system actually decoheres. Um, so if you wanted to do some coherent information transfer with the system, you could do that. Um, now we can analyze this a little bit further. Um, let's compare this to what was previously done by putting a Yig sphere into a 3D cavity. Um, uh, as I said, we can uh, calculate the um, uh, coupling here. Um, the, uh, we, we can now pull out what is the individual coupling per Bohr magneton, right? Um, as I mentioned before, the overall coupling um, squares as the individual spin coupling times the square root of the spins in our system. And just you know, using the volume um, of our system and the magnetization, we then get a coupling of 26.7 Hertz per spin, all right? Um, if we compare this to previous work by putting a Yig sphere into a bulk uh, resonator, we see that we are um, about three orders of magnitude better per spin. Um, part of the reason is that the uh, filling factor of our magnetic system in the resonator is much higher and it is really nicely easily positioned at a place uh, where we couple to the maximum of the air field. Um, and this is not even the best you can do. Um, right around the same time when we were working on this, uh, the group around Lu Xiao Leo at MIT came up with a similar idea using a different design for the superconducting resonator. And so they can get you know, a per spin coupling uh, um, that is even higher, an order of magnitude higher. So by judicious choice of how you design your photon cavity and your magnetic system, you can actually um, put this really nice. And so what this also means that you can miniaturize things in a very effective way. Um, the other thing is, what is nice is since the um, coupling is given by the R field, which is perpendicular to the permaloid stripe, to the magnetization of the permaloid stripe, we can of course change the coupling efficiency by rotating the magnetization in different ways. And so this is now shown here where the magnetic field is oriented in different directions. And as you can see from these curves here is as we rotate the magnetization into the perpendicular direction, the gap between the two modes shrinks more and more. Um, so in other words, the coupling is just given by the cosine of the um, um, direction of the applied magnetic field. So we can continuously tune the coupling as we like. Um, and so the, the only reason that you see still some gap feature here at zero field is, is that if you don't apply a field, of course the magnetization goes back along the direction of the permaloid stripe and, and you still couple to the R field. So, um, Um, this, this really describes this in, in, in the same words. The other thing that we can do is we can see if it really, this relationship that the coupling scales as a square root of N really holds by simply making devices uh, with different dimensions where we have different length and different thickness. So here we have the thickness reduced, here we have the thickness reduced and the length reduced. And um, as you can see indeed, 
we get uh, more or less linear behavior of the coupling strength with the um, um, square root of the volume of our system. Um, so, so indeed this relationship um, holds reasonably well. So there's various ways how we can tune um, our coupling strength uh, in uh, different ways. So for the last five minutes, I want to um, branch out and discuss yet another idea. Um, namely, we want to talk about how we can have hybrid marginal modes in uh, uh, multi-layered magnetic systems. Um, so as I said before, one of the nice things um, is with these microwave circuits that they are used for, for um, quantum systems already extensively uh, using superconducting quantum systems, but they are always two dimensional. It's really very hard to uh, make this in a much more three dimensional structure. And on the other hand, you know, we know that using various layered systems doesn't have to be fancy Thunderwalls layers like this, but even normal thin film layered structures, we can uh, create something much more complex in, in, in the third dimension. And so the question then is, can we use some kind of layered structure to then um, couple magnons also in the third dimension and uh, maybe provide a different pathway that may then allow us to generate uh, uh, microwave circuits um, that are much more complex and not just two-dimensionally limited. Okay, and um, so we can then certainly think of how we have a vertical structure that, that gives us you know, a specific magnum propagation path. Um, so looking at coupled magnons, um, we, uh, there has been already some work done nicely by looking at yttrium iron garnet, which as I said, is one of the materials of very low damping and therefore, uh, you know, long coherence times and other ferromagnetic layers. Um, so here in particular, um, they were looking at uh, Yig coupled to cobalt and you see that this is a rather thick uh, yig layer. You have various standing waves um, in the yig layer that then each couple with the excitation of the cobalt layer and you see there's strong coupling, there's a clear gapping of these structures there. All right, so let's look at this. We have here the resonance field as a function of frequency. Um, this is for the yig layer. Um, having the smaller magnetization, um, saturation magnetization, it typically lies over the curve that we get for our ferromagnetic layer, um, just by looking at these uh, Kittel equation, right? The larger saturation magnetization gives rise to the larger um, frequency. Um, but you can then have also um, modes in the yttrium iron garnet that are quantized along the thickness. Um, and so then you get an, an additional stiffening of these spin waves because of this exchange coupling. And so if you have like a quantized standing wave in the yttrium iron garnet, its frequency will move up. And so then you can get into a situation where these spin, uh, 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 spin wave modes will couple to the ferromagnetic resonance or will cross over with the ferromagnetic resonance of the um, uh, ferromagnetic layer. Now, this is the, the um, exchange coupling uh, uh, additional effective field here is quadratically dependent on the um, uh, wavelength of the spin wave. So if we um, reduce this thickness, we push this up higher so that instead of having this dense forest of modes, we get you know, individual modes that we can much easier investigate. Um, so um, our goal is then to uh, make the uh, yik thin enough so that we can just clearly separate uh, these two modes nicely. Okay, so what we do for this is we grow yttrium iron garnet on by sputtering on GGG, add uh, permaloy on top of it, 
we do a near the yttrium iron garnet to get nice uh, structural properties. Uh, the yttrium iron garnet is 100 nanometers thick, and then we vary the thickness of permalloy from 5 to uh, 16 nanometers. And indeed, what we see, we see um, that the uh, second spin wave mode of the yttrium iron garnet crosses over very nicely with the mode of the uh, permalloy. And uh, we see a clear mode uh, uh, separation here and anti-crossing here. Um, so let's now take this part of the data. Um, we take the yttrium iron garnet ferromagnetic resonance as a reference and um, uh, reference all the um, uh, fields with respect to uh, the resonance field of the yttrium iron garnet. So if we do that, um, the yttrium iron garnet mode doesn't move, the first spin wave mode doesn't move, but now you can clearly see how um, the permalloy mode um, disperses through the second spin wave mode of the yttrium iron garnet as a function of the frequency um, that we apply. And, and we see nicely this anti-crossing here. Okay, um, we can uh, ag again calculate um, what the uh, a coupling constant is. Um, it is indeed um, uh, relatively high, 350 megahertz. And if we calculate again the cooperativity um, by looking at the line width of the individual modes here and there, we get a cooperativity of around six. So that's um, um, still pretty good. Now there's one additional thing that is actually quite nice. If we now look at the line width of these modes as a function of frequency, um, this is for the YIG mode, this is for the uh, permalloy mode, um, we see an interesting feature, namely for the hybridized modes where we are in the hybridized uh, regime, there is an additional increase of the uh, damping here uh, over the intrinsic mode. And more interestingly, even here, we get a damping of the hybridized mode that's even below the damping of the actual leak mode, all right? And um, what is going on here is that um, we have additional coupling um, due to um, spin pumping between the permalloy and the yttrium iron garnet mode. So it gives us rise to this uh, uh, um, imaginary coupling constant, uh, which can give rise to the suppression of, of the damping. And um, I'm rushing a little bit through this because I have to be somewhere else in 10 minutes. Yeah, unfortunately, this whole symposium went a little later than I had hoped for. Um, so if you're really interested, I'll, I'll, I'll recommend that you read the details um, in, in this paper. Um, but, but ultimately, um, what, what we can tell is um, that here in the case where the damping is reduced, we have essentially an acoustic mode for the hybrid mode where the permalloy and yttrium iron garnet um, are moving with the same phase, um, while here where we get this additional damping, the permalloy and the yttrium iron garnet um, um, are out of phase like an optical mode. Okay, I'll really have to um, wrap it up here, unfortunately. I want to briefly mention who did the work. This work was done while I was still at Argon, uh, where I was until about a year and a half ago. And the main person is, is this guy, um, E. Uh, uh, Lee. He's a really uh, a fantastic young guy um, looking for a job right now. So if you have a good job at your institution, scoop him up, he's good. <laughs> so just briefly mentioning all the people, E. Lee was the main person that did this work uh, in our group with the help of uh, lots of people at Argon. Uh, Wei Zhang at Oakland University was also directly involved in these experiments. Um, some of the FMR measurements with the uh, YIC and the permaloy were done at Columbia. And uh, Mark Stiles and Vivek Amin were also directly involved in some of the theoretical discussion. I'll just uh, show my conclusions here and I'll be happy to answer a couple brief questions